We're pleased to have with us again, Dr. Jeremy England, a renowned physicist, former professor of physics at MIT, author of Every Life is on Fire, and currently a machine learning researcher in the biotech industry here in Israel. Welcome, Dr. England. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today, I've been looking forward to starting to talk a bit about korbanot, about sacrifices or burnt offerings uh, that the Torah commands us uh, to bring to the Mishkan, which is the tabernacle that is the, the central structure of the Mikdash, the temple. Uh, and I, I think that this is an enormous subject um, and is a subject that has many aspects to it. I don't intend this she or to be a, a to, to be one uh, focused on halacha, for example. But even if we leave aside the halachic aspects of korbanot, uh, I think there still are many different kinds of things to discuss about them, and, and I, I don't think we'll get to do all of it tonight. But that's exciting in a way because I think there's a, a lot of different things uh, in the Torah that that touch on this theme and that tell us about uh, its importance in the overall undertaking of avodat Hashem of serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So without uh, trying to review all the different aspects that could fit together, I, I'll just try to dive in from one direction and then we'll see how far we get tonight. And, and then I think uh, we can do other shiurim to try to tie some other passages that are relevant together. So I think as a preface for what I do want to talk about tonight, I, I want to point out something that may be obvious to many people, which is that there's a lot of thought in Yahadut, in Judaism, that makes it seem like we are living in an era where we have transcended or moved past the need uh, for actual physical sacrifices to be brought as part of the service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And there are different kinds of reasons for that. And you could actually trace them to different streams and in some ways they, they, they crop up in different places in the Jewish world as a whole and, and sometimes in places that, they, that don't seem to be ideologically motivated in remotely similar ways because it might both be the case that someone would say we don't really need to worry about burnt offerings etc uh, and the temple today because they're coming from a place of religious reform or modernization uh, where the degree to which they see the Torah having relevance to the present day world uh, is, is seen through a lens of the conventions uh, of this present era. And we, we think of sacrifices as being something that dates from an era that's very different and that had different expectations about what the world was and how it worked, et cetera, et cetera. So, that sounds like a, a very modern place from which skepticism about the importance of Korbanot could come. And at the same time, also, there's a very, uh, in one sense, traditional and religious set of attitudes. Um, and, and you might call them a classically Haredi set of attitudes about how this should be approached, uh, which ends up agreeing to a large degree uh, that this isn't something we should be concerning ourselves with now. And there, uh, it's coming from, in some ways, a very different place because the point is not to say, well, just because this is in the Torah, that doesn't necessarily mean it has, has currency in the present day, but rather it has to do with the history of the development of praxis in Yahadut, you know, keeping of the Torah as it was possible over the last many centuries. And what I would argue is the psychological impossibility of devoting oneself to keeping the Torah and being totally unable to keep hundreds of mitzvot in the Torah that are connected with the Mikdash uh, and, and still telling oneself all the time that you should be doing them. And because if you live in any part of the Jewish world 700 years ago, you are a very long way from when it was possible to fulfill this part of what's commanded in the Torah. And you're also, as it turns out, historically very far away in time from when it might become possible again. And for a person, whether in India or in Poland or in Ethiopia or wherever Jews were living, to tell him or herself, this is a huge part 
of what I am obligated to pursue in my service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but there's this, this onus, this, this force of circumstances around me that prevents me from doing it. And to tell yourself that every day, that in a sense, the Torah is in mothballs and a huge part of it is, or is in cryo-freeze, it's hibernating, it's not accessible to you, but it does matter a lot. That's very psychologically difficult to sustain as uh, an attitude about what you should be doing as an Oved Hashem. And there are those who did it. Uh, Rambam, Maimonides, is, is famous uh, for articulating a very practical and encouraging attitude about what can be done uh, with the Mikdash once the political and social circumstances are such that Jews actually have an opportunity to, to take hold of things again. Uh, and, and that was at a time when it must have seemed quite unlikely that that was going to happen anytime soon. But you can forgive to some degree a mindset that slants another way from developing because at the end of the day, for hundreds and hundreds of years, what it meant for a Jew to zealously perform the mitzvot commanded by the Torah and serve Hashem as he was able did not consist of or include these mitzvot. And so, of course, you're going to develop a culture that seems not to need these mitzvot and, and not to relate to them. And of course, you're going to develop even, I would say, an elaborate system of halachic arguments for not just saying right now we can't do it, so don't think about it too much, but even maybe starting to tell yourself, well, maybe it's asur, maybe it's forbidden, maybe we're not permitted to do this. And, and I can feel even better about the fact that I'm not able, because even if I were able, it would be asur, it would be forbidden, I wouldn't be allowed. Um, and, and that's very reassuring. So in fact, even today, uh, at the entrance uh, to the walkway leading up to Harabai, to the Temple Mount, by which Jews are allowed to enter under limited circumstances, there is a sign that forewarns that the chief rabbinate of the state of Israel uh, would like everyone to know that according to Jewish law, it is forbidden to go up to Harabai. Now, of course, this is in fact a more complicated discussion in Halakha, uh, but the existence of an understanding of Yahadut and the practice and, and keeping of uh, mitzvot and Abu Dat Hashem that would maintain such a position. It's an understandable psychological burden we carry out of Galut. And it, it, it makes sense that this would have uh, settled on so many of us over time as perhaps a comforting structure of halakhic understandings because it feels better to say Hashem forbids me from doing something than it does to say maybe I might be able to do it but contingent circumstances prevent me because then I have to reflect on the question of whether my own efforts could make the difference or not. Uh, and, and the reason I, I give so much uh, voice to considering that aspect is because I think it ends up being the case that very different, seemingly different streams in worldviews that touch on different parts uh, of the Jewish population of the world as a whole are often making reference to the same ideas or the same sources to some degree when trying to justify themselves. Because whether you are coming from what you might call a more uh, uh, modernizing or Hellenizing or modernistic viewpoint and saying that was something for a different era, but that part of the Torah has no relevance in the present day uh, and, and just excising parts of the Torah that, that seem not to fit anymore. Or whether you are coming from what you might call a more uh, Haredi or Galut oriented um, relationship to Jewish law that on the one hand is very zealous about certain fractions of the Torah or parts of, of Jewish law, but on the other hand, maybe is, is quite adamant about not letting daylight into the parts that have uh, been walled off for so long, because if they were walled off 300 years ago, then our desire to imitate people who lived 300 years ago supersedes other imperatives. Uh, whether you're, you're articulating things from either of those positions, one of the places you might like to start in making your argument from sources in Tanakh uh, are these famous passages in Nevi'im 
in the prophets that seem to say that HaKadosh Baruch is not really interested in, in offerings anymore. He's not really interested in korbanot, in, in sacrifices being brought. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to get to go into all the different sources of this kind, and certainly not into all the reactions that we have in Chazal um, and, and later Koskim. Um, and it, it needs to be said at the outset that this is a complicated issue, and I don't want to sort of sweep it all the way and dismiss it. Chazal do have things to say to us that are trying to help the mind of the Oved Hashem cope with the beginning of a very long galut and saying things like our tfilot, which follow the pattern of the daily offerings, shacharit, mincha, and arvit, uh, that shacharit and mincha are following actual uh, olot tamid, uh, and then arvit has to do with the disposal of, of what remains from the, the offerings. And so the cycle of daily prayers of, of morning and afternoon and evening is following uh, the, the korbanot that we were supposed to bring in the temple. And, and we, we are taught by our sages that there is a sense in which there's an equivalency to this, where we are not failing entirely uh, to carry out uh, these mitzvot uh, uh, because we, we can't relate to them physically because we have tefillah and it, and it connects us. Um, and, and we can talk more about that maybe in another shiur. Um, so we're not going to talk about those sources today, but I'll just say, there's a reason people draw on, on these, these sources from Nevi'im we're about to talk about, which seem to be saying Hashem is sort of tired of, uh, of, of sacrifices um, and, and we're ready to move on. Um, they're there to draw on and Chazal gave correct interpretations of them, but we have to give correct interpretations of Chazal and that's complicated. Uh, but I just want to focus on one example here today uh, of a source from Tanakh that is quite famous. Uh, that I think really stands for how we actually need to approach this question of what indeed did Hashem say through his prophets, through his Nevi'im, about how he felt about korbanot, about sacrifices. Um, and, and is it indeed the case that he, he just decided one day to tell us he wasn't interested in them anymore? And I think the thing that we have to really also underline here is that in a way that is relevant to this discussion, the world in which these events took place, the world in which Bait Rishon and Bait Sheni stood, and the world in which the destructions of the temples and the aftermath of those took place, was a different world uh, in many respects. And one very important respect is that the failure modes in Avodat Hashem were different, meaning the typical ways that Bnei Yisrael would fail in their mission to serve Hashem properly, according to the Torah, we're not the same necessarily as the typical ways uh, that we fall short today. Now, what do I mean by that? You see this all over Tanakh, and this is how we're gonna understand these sources in a second, that it was not in the time of a, an actual Mikdash standing, you know, the time of, of Bait Rishon, the, the temple that Shlomo built, or of Bait Sheni. It was not hard to get people behind the idea that korbanot, that sacrifices, were a good idea, right? That was not actually a hard sale to make. The hard thing to do was to get them to not relate idolatrously, idolatrously to those sacrifices and not to turn their avodah into something not worth more than the avodah of pagans in the ancient world at the same time. Because in the ancient world, pagans brought sacrifices in all sorts of temples and they all thought it made sense, right? That you bring a burnt offering, you lay it before your idol or whatever, you use it in some ritual that connects you to your deity and you get something from it, right? You maybe get protection, you maybe get some kind of blessing. Uh, and, and this is a very difficult thread to disentangle when you're reading how this is talked about in Tanakh because Tanakh as a whole does not teach us to relate to Mikdash as a magical vending machine whereby we get blessings from the heavens by performing certain rituals, where it's it's sort of a, a sorcery cookbook, where if we do these things, we get the rains and we get the good harvest and we get protection from our enemies and all of that, protection from sickness, et cetera, et cetera. That is not, in fact, the transaction that's being laid out. However, it is on the knife's edge from being misunderstood in that way, because that is the typical failure mode of the pagan. The pagan says, oh, Hashem promises blessing, if I do these things, 
So I'm going to do these things now in order to get the blessing. And I, I will order from this part of the menu and I'll forget this other part, meaning I still want to steal and murder people when it suits me. And maybe I'll oppress widows and orphans, et cetera. I will not give uh, to the poor and I, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I will do all the things that feel inconvenient to me that we now often think of more in terms of these are kind of the ethical enjoinders of the Torah. Uh, but Sure, I'll, I'll bring sacrifices. I'll bring lots of sacrifices in the temple. And, and I believe that will give me, you know, the, the, this is the pagan speaking, right? That will give me bounteous agricultural crops. That will give me victory in war. That will give me protection from plagues and disease. And, and so then I'm fully taken care of. And the Nevi'im, the prophets of the Hebrew Bible are railing against that attitude for the most part. Right? They're, there's, they're pointing at all these people who bring sacrifices and observe holidays because the piety is worth something to them. They enjoy the experience of piety or they believe that it has magical properties that will help them, but that they are at the same time unconcerned with other aspects of the Torah that are equally important because it's a package deal. You can't have a functioning body that has a heart but doesn't have lungs or vice versa, right? The, the, the sages tell us that the 613 mitzvot divide into 365 days of the year and 248 parts of the body. Now, 248 in one sense is what you get when you subtract 613, you know, when you subtract 365 from 613. Um, there are other things to say about 248. It's interesting that two times two times two gives you two and four and eight. And so there's more to talk about there some other time, but 248, uh, parts of the body, the point Chazal are making there, I think, is that the Torah is a, is a whole. And you can't just say, I want the heart, but I don't want the lungs. It doesn't work unless you put it all together, uh, which is another reason why Korbanot and things like that are not something we should just be content with ignoring and forgetting about and keeping uh, in hibernation for the rest of human history. Uh, but in any case, if you're going to pick and choose from the menu, that's a problem. In the case of Jews who wanted to keep the Torah to the degree that they felt comfortable and then forget the parts they didn't want, in the time of the Nevi'im and the time of the Batemik Dash that stood, it may have been more common that you had people who found it an inconvenience to do what we think of as the ethical part, maybe not stealing, committing adultery, what have you, but they were perfectly happy. They thought it was good business. They thought it was maybe satisfying in a more sort of uh, what you sometimes think about in the, the stereotype from American movies of mafiosi who sort of uh, go to church with great zeal, but they will you know kill and steal and murder in in their. But they enjoy that. They enjoy the ritual. They enjoy the piety of it. It may not even be that just that they think of it crassly that it's good for business. They're able to make separation somehow. Right? They, they are willing to seek expiation from their gods, perhaps, uh, but want first to transgress. And, and the, all of that, you can roll it up and say, okay, Yeshayahu or Amos or these various other Nevi'im who excoriate, you know, Yirmiyahu, who excoriate all the hypocrisy and the failure of, of, of B'nai Israel in this land, in Eretz Israel during the time when the temple stood. That was maybe the more common thing. But you have another way, obviously, of missing the point. And maybe that's hugely more common today, which is to say, well, what really the Torah is about is the mitzvot that we call ethical mitzvot, the mitzvot that we call morality. And, and the whole Torah is about getting us to do that stuff. And if we can manage to do that stuff without needing the guardrails that are there, then we're good. We're all set. We're, we're fine. We so. This kind of a, and this is maybe the more sort of modernistic view, or you, know, you could perhaps say it, it becomes uh, possible for it to be in another sense. I, I, I think you have to modify it in order to make it sound like a more sort of galut or, or Haredi view, but it, it, it has commonalities there where you say, let's focus on Ve'ahavta Lerech Kamocha, a wonderful mitzvah. Let's focus on not oppressing the orphan in the window, with the widow, a, a wonderful mitzvah. Let's focus on staka. Let's focus on things, uh, not murdering or stealing. I mean, I was talking about things that are, are considered more difficult, but we also shouldn't murder and steal, right? 
all of those things make it on the list. And then when it comes to Korbanot, you say, well, okay, it's true that when I do some kind of avera and I transgress by accident, in principle, I would bring in Ola Chatat, right? I, I, I would, sorry, I would bring a Korban Chatat. Uh, I would bring a sacrifice that uh, is uh, to be made in the temple that's in the form of an animal that I have to bring to Yerushalayim, et cetera. But the fact that I'm not doing that, I can still not murder. So it seems that I'm okay. And, and that is the attitude that I think we have to uh, work to, un to unpack and understand and analyze, and I would argue ultimately to struggle against uh, in the present day. Or you could make a slightly different version of it, we would say more modernistically, be precisely because someone believes and understands that it doesn't magically make your crops better if you bring sacrifices according to the cookbook laid out in, say, Sefer uh, Vaikra, that there's no reason to do it, right? Someone who's thinking very scientifically and modernistically would say, people used to believe this stuff was, you know, in desperation, their way of trying to propitiate the weather or, or what have you. Uh, and they were wrong. And now we understand that the weather is such and such, and it's deriving from these other laws that are amoral and uh, perhaps somewhat chaotic and random and don't care about whether we bring sacrifices when we sin or on holidays or whatever. So we don't need it for that purpose, right? So you have this whole maelstrom of different kinds of attitudes that in the present day would say either let's focus on these mitzvot because really this is about um, uh, making us ethical people. And you hear this even very much in the Orthodox Jewish world. Or if you're talking about the broader Jewish world, it's even easier to find someone to say, what's the point of this, right? This one hill in Yerushalayim, why do we need to bring animals there and burn them up? Uh, it seems like it doesn't do anything. And so I really want to start, but definitely won't finish tonight. I really want to start talking about what are the different things that that activity actually does? Uh, and there are some things we have to grapple with that are challenging, which we won't get to tonight, because there are statements made in Tanakh that do seem to not exactly say the vending machine thing, but they connect things like uh, protection from danger or, or blessing in agriculture to the Mikdash. Um, and in order to understand what the Torah is saying and what, the, what Tanakh is saying, if it's not saying, put in your coin and get out what you want from it, um, then we really need a whole discussion of that. So we'll do that another time. But with all of that lead up, what I now wanna do is go and look at this source from Amos, which is a very famous one, partly because uh, a, a verse from it uh, is quoted in one of the most famous speeches in American history made by Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and uh, it is uh, a very inspiring image uh, that does seem to focus on the primacy, according to biblical uh, instruction, of what we think of as the morality aspects of serving Hashem. So what is the source? So Amos says in the name of Hashem, Saneti ma'asti hagechem velo ariah ba'artzotechem. Ki im ta'alu li olot o min ho'techem lo erze v'shalem merichem lo abit. Haser me'alai hamon shirecha v'zimrat nevalecha lo eshma. Vayigal kamayim mishpat u'tzdaka Okay, so what is this? First, Hashem is saying, I loathe, I spurn your festivals. I'm not appeased by your solemn assemblies. If you offer me burnt offerings or meal offerings, I won't accept them. I will pay no heed to your gifts of fatlings. Spare me the sounds of your songs, your hymns. Let me not hear the music of your instruments that you play in the Mikdash. And then there's this famous line, but let justice well up like water, righteousness like an unfailing stream. And that last pasuk is the one that I'm gonna want to make more out of. The source I have underneath this is what I was saying already, right? That Amos is explaining earlier in the same passage why Hashem is saying, I hate your offerings, I'm not interested in them. Because the people he's speaking to are taking bribes, they're subverting justice, and harming the cause of the needy, et cetera, et cetera. They're doing all of these things that ethical people rightly condemn. And so it's quite easy to, to 
draw a circle around these two sources and other examples like it in Yeshayahu, in Yermiyahu, a lot of different Nevi'im who are excoriating the people for failing in their service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's easy to, to draw a circle around these and say, this sounds like what the Navi is saying is HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want these things that you're giving him, which is you're bringing all of these sacrifices in the sort of mafioso way of enjoying the piety or thinking you're buying something like good luck. Um, he, he doesn't want that. He just wants you to be good to each other. He wants you to not murder each other and steal from each other, etc. Now, there's already logically a problem with this on its face, which is where did we get the idea that Akados Baruch Hu wanted us to be doing these things, right? This was not something that was invented by people who said, well, the Torah is telling me not to murder, and I do want to do that, but what I'm now going to do is invent something else that I can do to propitiate this judge and king who has a problem with my murdering, and, and I'll just make it up myself. We didn't make it up, right? It's part of the Torah also. It is also a set of mitzvot that are commanded, no less so than lo tirzach, which is don't murder, or lo tignov, which is do not steal. And <clears throat> not only that, but the Torah, and I, I think I'm going to jump down to a source lower down here. So the Torah in Sefer Dvarim, in the book of Deuteronomy, talks about how we should view the statements of Nevi'im, of prophets. There's a whole passage in Parshat Shoftim that's talking about the, the Navi, the Cholem the, Halom. Maybe there are different kinds of people, maybe they're the same person, but in any, way, in any case, someone who comes with a vision who comes with revelation and wants to share with the people. But this passage describes all sorts of procedures for, you know, how do you test whether the Navi is speaking the word of Hashem? But it begins with perhaps the most important point. Be careful to observe only that which I enjoin upon you. Neither add to it, nor take away from it. And the importance of this statement is very simple. If a Navi comes and the sense of his nivua is, I am going to permanently cancel and remove this piece of the pie, this part of the Torah, these mitzvot. These mitzvot are not for you to keep for the rest of time. Uh, then he is not a Navi who's speaking in the name of Hashem. He's a Navi Sheker. He's a false Navi. And that doesn't mean the VM can't come and say things that we said we have to think carefully about. Uh, Rambam does discuss, for example, the, the fact that Nevi'im can temporarily say that it is possible to transgress uh, mitzvot, and, and maybe we should listen to a Nevi if it's a true Nevi, etc. There, there, there are complicated circumstances. It becomes kind of this pilpul about halacha and you know, what, what is the specific situation that we're in. But something categorical like saying, look, we don't keep these, this part of the Torah anymore, that a Nevi would never say a true Navi, a Navi of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And so when we go to Amos, or when we go to any of these other Navi who say things like this, to the degree that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying something like, Saneti ma'asti hagechem, I, I loathe your festivals, I don't want you. Is he saying, don't keep Pesach anymore? No, he is not saying that. What he's saying is, what is this worth to me if you don't keep the rest of the Torah? And the thing that we now need to recognize in the present day is that that logic could just as easily be applied in the opposite way. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because of this enjoinder not to add to or take away from the Torah, that he also would say, what is what you're doing worth to me if you don't keep the rest of the Torah? Right? That if you just focus on what you call either the ethical part of the Torah, or let's expand that to the ritual parts of the Torah that have been easy to keep in the diaspora, Kashrut, Shabbat, things like that. But you ignore things like Shemitah, um, you know, keep letting the land rest every seven years. Uh, you ignore things like Yovel, you ignore things that involve the, the Mikdash and Korbanot, and you say, those go, you know, in the lockbox uh, until the universe doesn't exist anymore or something like that. That is equally problematic according to this principle. And anyone uh, who interprets a Navi from Tanakh as saying that is willfully or accidentally misreading Tanakh. Uh, and, and this passage almost is the, is the best proof of that, first of all, on its face in Pshat, because the context for this first quotation is the earlier statement 
that Hashem is already saying, because of your crimes, because you have no righteousness and you're taking bribes, etc., now I'm, I'm not interested in your offerings. But I think there's also, interestingly, uh, a subtextual point that makes this uh, perhaps click together even more nicely. So this, this beautiful, inspiring image, let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. So the, the image that we have here is the, 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 the flowing stream or the roaring stream, Nahal Eitan, not just a Nahal, Nehalim are wadis or sort of these miniature canyons that have been carved by water and have water flowing through the bottom of them. But Nehalim, it's not just talking about a Nahal, it's talking about a Nahal Eitan. So it's a great and mighty Nahal. Nehalim are mentioned many, many times in the Torah itself and in Tanakh in general. There are very few mentions of a Nahal Eitan. The one in the Torah itself uh, is a very interesting one. Uh, it is in the context of a very curious and peculiar mitzvah that is called the Egla Arufa. Egla Arufa is a mitzvah that we are supposed to use according to the Torah in an instance where a dead body is found in between two towns and people don't know how it got there. And so you think of it as sort of in the context of modern entertainment, this is like the murder mystery where someone finds the crime scene and, and the way people in the present day, you know, uh, in, in the, the crime drama series set in Manhattan or what have you, what they're going to do is they're going to start making forensic measurements of various kinds and go interview people and, and they're going to catch the criminal because they're going to they're going to figure it out. But this mitzvah commands a very different set of behaviors, right? This mitzvah is not telling us to start looking for DNA evidence or, or start uh, trying to do ballistics uh, on uh, the bullet that we found at the crime scene or whatever. It's saying instead that you're to take an egla, which is a female calf, and one that is not, that has not ever been used to plow a field, lo badba, so it wasn't, uh, you didn't put a, a yoke on it, a sherlo mashcha be'ol. So this is a, a calf that hasn't been allowed to work a field. Uh, and you you go with the skenim, with the elders, and with the shoftim, the judges, uh, and, and you are going to take this egla and bring it to a nahal etan. You bring it to one of these thunderously flowing canyons, and then you're supposed to break the neck of this egla and, and toss it in. So it's va'arfu sham et ha'egla banahal. Why is that interesting? Well, in addition to this, there's also a whole context that's described um, for this ritual that involves the Kohanim. Uh, so it's not just about the judges. Uh, it is about the priests as well. It says, When ikshu ha-kohanim v'nei levi ki vam bahar Adonai elohecha li sharto ulevarech b'shem Adonai v'al pihem yihyeh kol riv so the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come forward for Hashem, the Lord, has, uh, for your God, Hashem, has chosen them for divine service and to pronounce blessing in the name of Hashem. And every lawsuit in the case of assault is subject to their ruling. Um, uh, that's one translation. There are others that read Naga'a differently and might involve other things Kwanim are involved in that are more ritual, like Tzarat, which is an affliction, and Nega might be the word used for it. So... And then it goes on there. So there's the whole, the rest of the, the ritual. It involves koanim. And this is how you're supposed to purge evil from your midst, et cetera, et cetera. The main thing I would just want to focus on is, is the following, that the koanim are part of this. And what are we doing? We're taking an animal and we're killing the animal. And the koanim are there. And why are we killing the animal? Are we killing the animal to eat it? No. Are we killing the animal because as in a different part of the Torah, it stampeded and trampled people to death um, and it's a dangerous animal and we have to get rid of it and there's a practical need. No, this animal is being killed for a solely ritual purpose. And indeed, 
if you didn't already have the idea about Yahadut, that we have a Mikdash and there is one place that the Torah commands us to do sacrifices, and that is in Harabayit in Yerushalayim, and so we don't do these other things uh, that, you know, people in Tanakh, for example, sometimes did, doing sacrifices elsewhere, and also we certainly don't uh, go to other temples, you know, that serve other gods and do these sacrifices, yet this mitzvah, from, to an outsider, to an alien, so to speak, who comes and sees this for the first time, would say, this looks like a sacrificial ritual. You're taking an animal that you have no practical need for. You're going to lose the animal. You're throwing it into a flowing canyon, um, and it's going to leave you. It looks like a different kind of sacrifice, maybe, than the ones that we do in Harabai, but it is a purely ritually motivated killing of an animal that has the same priests who do the sacrifices in Harabai standing there. Uh, and you're doing it as a commandment of the Torah. So I'm not trying to say this is a korban. I don't think we have to confuse terminology here. The point is not to say this is a sacrifice in the understanding of Yadut and Jewish law. The point is to say this is a mitzvah that if we had to pick it as an example of a mitzvah where we're trying to classify these are the ethical mitzvot and these are the ritual ones, this is an extremely ritual mitzvah. And interestingly, it's occurring in a context that seems like an extremely ethically important situation, right? There's a crime scene, and, and we relate to the crime scene in the modern day as we're going to find the murderer. We're, you know, we're going to do the ballistics and do the DNA evidence and prove who the murderer is, and then maybe imprison the murderer, murderer or punish the murderer, uh, because we have all of these methods for, for tracing what might have happened in the past. But the Torah is saying, when you come into the situation where there were no witnesses, you don't try to still find someone to blame and punish. What you do instead, and I, I don't want to go into whether the king would do differently because the king's law is in another category of things, even if we're talking in, in this ancient time. So we're not necessarily saying you don't try to punish people for doing things that are not mandated by Torah law. But in any case, um, the Torah itself is not saying come into this situation and try to do something that feels satisfactory to us in an ethical retributive sense. It's saying, do a ritual that looks like sacrifice and do it with your koanim, with your priests, and whose role here is explicitly in the, in the verses that we just read, called out to be about playing this role of speaking in Hashem's name and blessing the people, right? So it's identifying the koanim as having this ritual role. And, and what do I want to tie this back to now? What do, why do we start talking about this? We started talking about this because it said, Vaigal kamai mishpat Let justice well up like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. But that's the English translation. What is the Hebrew actually? What Amos is saying is, Vaigal kamai mishpat. What is mishpat? Mishpat is a law, right? Like, for example, we have in the Torah a parasha that begins, Ve'ele. Hamishpatim. These are the laws that Hashem gave to the people at Sinai. And that list of laws has all sorts of things in it. It is not just justice. It is not uh, the set of things that you think a shofet necessarily would always be judging. Uh, there are a lot of laws that come out, and it is not necessarily so easy to distinguish here uh, things that we think of as being about justice as the word sounds in English, and things that might be other mishpatim, other laws that are part of the Torah, and, and that may even require a shofet, but are not necessarily uh, what we would call ethical laws. For example, down here, in this passage, which is the only appearance of the phrase nachal etan in the Torah in its entirety, we're doing a ritual law involving the priests that looks like a sacrifice. So we're killing an animal in a way that is quote unquote pointless, according either to the modern view or the ethically focused view. And also here, according to this source, we have shoftim, right? Elders, skinim, and also shoftim are supposed to come. And the shoftim are supposed to measure here between the cities. So that they, they're supposed to measure which city is closer to the, the corpse that they've discovered. So apparently a shofet, according to the Torah, is someone who must be involved in a mitzvah involving this crime scene that is profoundly 
not ethically focused in the response mandated by the Torah, and instead involves the Kohanim standing there while something is being done to a sacrificial species of animal that looks like a sacrifice. And that was how Amos chose to make this famous statement by Egal Kamai Mishpat Utztakah He's saying, let Mishpat well up like water, meaning Mishpatim, meaning the laws of the Torah. Let's keep all the laws of the Torah. That's what he's saying. Utztakah And, you know, if we want, we could also do a perush about the word tzedek and, and the uses of it in the Torah and the word staka even, and the uses of it in the Torah and whether how we halakhically or in modern language talk about the word staka and whether that really maps onto in every respect what the Torah is talking about when it uses the word staka. Um, but in any case, the point here is not that this isn't about giving staka or, or it isn't about uh, mishpatim such as lo tirtzach, don't murder, or, or you know, that you shouldn't oppress widows and orphans. It's just not less about other mishpatim or other things in the Torah that are commanded uh, that may involve judges, may involve bedin somehow, um, but, but also involve koanim perhaps, uh, and also may have very ritual aspects. So this is just one example of a source like this. There are others, uh, you know, Yeshayahu, as I mentioned, uh, has other famous passages like the ones we read in Haftarah and Yom Kippurim, you know, that he, he has no interest, Hashem has no interest, according to Yeshayahu, in uh, the, the fasting that we're doing. You call this a fast. Uh, and, and so you could go passage by passage and try to do this kind of analysis on each of them. I think this one makes it especially crisp. Amos never came to tell B'nai Yisrael that Hashem has exempted us for eternity from all the mitzvot of the Torah having to do with animal sacrifice. Uh, he even, not so cryptically, hints that this is the case in the statement that's calling for more mishpat and more tzedakah, because calling for more mishpat and more tzedakah means keeping more of the Torah, not keeping only the parts of the Torah that might have more obviously been referenced in the English translation uh, uh, of justice and righteousness. Uh, and instead, what this comment, this extremely subtle comment by Amos is telling us uh, is that we shouldn't be trying to pry apart the parts of the Torah that seem ethical and the parts of the Torah that seem ritual or the parts that have to do with koanim and sacrifice and the parts that have to do with uh, the gritty everyday things that happen, like a body being found where no one knows where it came from. Because the mitzvah of Egla Arufa is exactly the mitzvah that rolls all of these things together and says, this is one mitzvah. And the shoftim are there, and the koanim are there, uh, and the nachalitan is there. And so that's why I'm, I think chooses to use this language uh, to, to enjoin upon us always to say, think of the logic of this statement. Hashem, if you are keeping half of the Torah and saying the other half I'm not concerned about. It doesn't matter anymore as a practical requirement for my actions. That Hashem will say, what good does this have to be if you're throwing the other half out the window? And especially in an era where many things are much more practically within reach or close to that uh, than they have been for centuries, that's a point that we have to uh, carry forward. So I, I think that I have some other sources here that really are probably the beginning of another shi'or, because there's also the question of why animal sacrifice, why why not a salad, why is that not good enough? Um, and I, I would like to maybe do a whole shi'or about that. So I'm not going to talk about kind and heaven right now. Uh, I think this is a good place to, to finish up and maybe we can have a bit of discussion and questions. Does anybody have any questions? Or comments? Yes, Bracha? Oh, no, okay. Well, I just wanted to comment that it is a very interesting point to look at the, the, the a major problem with uh, that you point out very eloquently today, particularly what was, is that those who are willing to cut out a very large percentage of the Torah um, 
they they they're they have a lot of explaining to do as far as uh, how how they view the Torah as one wholesome whole. Yeah, and I think in the spirit of of trying to give the best credit that one can to the arguments of people one disagrees with, I suppose you'd have to say that from the perspective of someone who, who wants to say, we of course would love to keep all the mitzvot of the Torah, um, but of course it is in many circumstances not practically possible. There's all sorts of uh, kinds of honest, of, of sort of coercive circumstances that one can be in. And just as uh, Hashem deciding to put us in a situation where we somehow can't save someone's life except by violating Shabbat, that means he doesn't want us to keep Shabbat in that situation. Um, so too might it also be the case that he puts us in a situation uh, where he doesn't want us to be bringing korbanot, um, and, and, and that uh, also is something to be considered, and we're just waiting for the time when it's possible. That That is in one sense, a reasonable position. And then what it comes down to is the longer discussion of what it means for it to be possible and, and where the line is between complacency or simply turning off uh, the whole thought process about how to accomplish something versus saying, well, right now, okay, the weather isn't good right now, but we're always looking for an opening. Uh, and the the arguments that are made for the impossibility of doing uh, these kinds of activities because, the, because of how we have uncertainty about locations of things, which are arguable, as many, was, many would disagree, we're not so uncertain about where different things were on Arabite, or because of issues having to do with ritual impurity that can't be dealt with yet, although there also is a rich halakhic discussion about that, and there are solutions and and really you know, basic uh, cancellations of that concern um, that we have from our sages that seem to put us in a good situation there. Uh, but I, I understand this is a, it can be a complicated discussion. It, everything like this should be an honest and open argument discussion amongst well-meaning of De Hashem who are trying to read the Torah and make their case from those sources. But I think anyone who on the other side treats this like this is clear cut, open shut. Uh, why are we even talking about this? Uh, we, we have to wait for an otherworldly end of days in which nothing about how the world currently works is assumed uh, to necessarily still hold. And we're certain of that already. And we're not looking for indications that the bus might be coming sooner, so to speak. That starts to sound a little bit too eager to reach a certain conclusion. Uh, and that gets back to the, the psychoanalytic point I was making earlier, that one has to wonder when someone seems very comfortable with an easy solution of saying, we just simply can't touch any of this. It stays in the lockbox. Um, there, are a, uh, there are a number of halakhic sources one can quote that seem to indicate an impossibility. And so we shouldn't look further. We shouldn't look at Rambam uh, uh, or, or people like him, you know, heavyweights like him who, who might've said something different uh, because uh, we made our decision. You have to wonder whether this is uh, a problematic situation of coming to the wrong conclusion because one wants to and insisting on it, because really it, it fits into a, a worldview and, a, and a, an approach that can't uh, comprehend the emotional and psychological transformation that's required in one's attitude about what Yahadut, what Judaism is, in order for it to start to consist of things that it hasn't consisted of for a very long time. Uh, at the end of the day, there is a large fraction of what we call the Orthodox Jewish world that it has to be admitted, I think, is strongly leaning in the direction of taking a particular moment or set of moments in the last thousand years, not even really earlier than that, but let's say, or even 
the last eight or seven or 600 years uh, and seeing the greatest keepers of the Torah during those periods as models that uh, cannot be challenged or uh, competed with through argument from sources. Um, and, and then that leads to just saying, well, if they weren't doing this, and if they were dressed this way, and if they were keeping the rules in the following way, then, then who are we to do differently? Um, and, and once you operate that way, uh, one, one can crit criticize that position from within the Torah for being uh, unwilling to keep the Torah, even though in another sense, uh, it obviously shows great zeal for certain aspects of the Torah. And if you, if you take part of the Torah and insist on keeping it zealously uh, well, permanently ignoring the rest of it, there's a sense in which that uh, has to be called out as, as being at risk of, of turning into idolatry, despite its zeal for uh, many aspects of the true Torah that Hashem gave us. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Haim's message, and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org. If you are inspired by Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to get involved in Torah Eretz Yisrael activities in your local area, please fill out the relevant form by going to the link which appears on the screen.